Hello everybody, Brian here from quantlabs.net. Just wanted to go over with you um, my second attempt at this strategy. Some of the indicators I'm using are very different. I'll try to walk you through it. But right now, I just want to show you that we definitely have a hot little trade on right now with the US Japanese yen. Today is Friday, February 16th at 2.02 my time, Eastern Standard Time. So currently what we have here is we have a summary of positions here, three of them, that are at this amount on the PL live on a demo account using J4X. And um, there's a bunch of things I want to walk you through. First, um, I'm now using RSI. Okay, there's a lot of things that I'm noticing on RSI, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Because see here, the um, conditions uh, get pretty tight in here as the trend goes up. We made a little bit of money across this range. It's a one minute chart. We're also making money on this level on the rise up. You can see here there are some uh, down bars. Now here's the RSI on that, those trends. Um, but one other thing I want you to realize is um, with typical trading. Um, you don't want to over trade these situations here. So what I've done is in my code in the I've, I've now put a limit on how many positions my system will uh, take on. Um, I should say number of positions Market per entry cross for... pair. So in this case with the US uh, dollar, Japanese yen, or any currency pair, currently I'm only going to take no more than five. What I find is if I let the system take on more positions than it really needs to, it'll overtrade it. You'll have, for the moment, your positive P&L. And at the same time, what will happen is as those trades come off on the potential upswing, you got, let's say, 10, 20 of these things on the one cross, these losses can stagger into quick losses. So as a result, as part of, call it risk management or whatever, I'm throttling the positions. Uh, this is a very rare opportunity I've, I see um, to have an upward moment here, but right now I have a, a Python script running um, and what would be happening is it would trigger more orders to come in. Market entry for. You can hear the background of market entry for. Um, the Python script saying it wants to put on the trade, but if the RSI is more than 50, it won't take on the trade because here you're going to take on a few more losses from my experience. And I'll just keep these original trades on and locked on, and that's it. And as we ride it up, we should be we should be able to get more profit. Um, if I was to look at the tick data, the tick data does definitely tell a better story. Um, but you have seen that here, this P&L real time uh, from the broker can change literally on a micro level, as you can see there, like 30 cents in seconds. So the closing logic or the exit logic may need to be put on the tick um, event or tick method, not on the bar method. So I'm, I'm actually checking these positions on tick data versus minute data. Um, so this is one discovery I have seen where you can see all the number of trades it wants to put on. This JavaScript will prevent that from happening. It won't take on the trade if it's more than 50. And it seems to kind of work. I'm probably missing out on more opportunities, but just with these th three positions, it will continue to ride the trend up as it's what it's doing here. We are using ATR, but we're not using a static ATR, meaning um, if you have a position put on here and the ATR um, is set for, let's say 10% on that entry, it will kick out of the trade and you take on a small loss, which I get a lot of, but um, it's these type of trends you want. So if you put on an ATR on the upside, so like for instance uh, here, uh, there may be a downtrend, or better yet, if I had 
a position here entry and then I put on an ATR of 10% on the upper uh, range, what will happen is it will kick out the trade and we wouldn't be getting these um, uptrends at all. Like it wouldn't hang on to these uptrend in the trades. So what I do is in my ATR, I update the ATR um, based upon um, the last position as the as it moves up. So essentially what happens is it moves up in this case here and if the market does turn and it breaches the lower end of the newly updated ATR, it will kick out a trade because it figures once you go into a downtrend, it will um, exit the trade and you've, you've, you've made a bit of money based around that. But you can clearly see it's sort of working. Now because it's working, I'm able to uh, take on more profit as the positions uh, hang on on the upward trend. But here's the interesting thing on the RSI. As we know if the RSI is more than 80%, right now there is a huge demand for uh, this pair, the dollar yen pair, and um, over time it's gonna it's gonna start to drop off here. As you can see here, it's already dropped off to 55 um, as one potential indicator. But the problem is there's so many factors and so many different scenarios. This is just one. This is the ideal situation to have as an example I can show you. You can see here that as, as, as the trend rides up, it will continue to um, make more money as it hangs on in these positions, updates the ATR um, as hopefully the, the trend moves up, which it clearly is. All right, so let's take a look at the behind the scenes because there's more. Another big thing is if you look at my strategies panel, there's actually two strategy jar files or Java files running. This one's taken the order. Uh, this particular QLN order to be, it's just my naming convention, that takes on the order um, and just added a new position. Actually, it's added a new. So here we are now um, talk, taking on the Swiss franc. Um, this, this is where uh, the market, based upon the pairs, uh, I, uh, this is another good scenario. Right now what's happening in the market is when the market uh, goes defensive, as I, I call it, I notice that a lot of these quote um, base uh, pairs, like in this case the Swiss franc and, and the Japanese yen, are the two most common used where algorithms will do forex trading, but it will use these pairs as a base, just the yen and the Swiss franc. And that purely tells me um, the market is in defensive mode. And that is just how the system works. Another thing is when I see a lot of the yen uh, as, as part of the defensive, I could also see the British pound and other ones. Um, this is usually where the market's gone defensive at least from Duca's copy of the broker. That's what the market data is telling me. Also with the CHF, the Swiss franc, usually I never make any profit whatsoever. So um, in do the franc, I'm just never making money or rarely do. You can see that we do definitely have a monster opportunity here with uh, the yen. My system should kick out of the trades by now, but it's not. Um, but you know it's part of the debugging process. But you could clearly see here that the the franc, this is franc, is, is a money losers. But the um, yen are clearly um, the winners in this position right now. Now, as I said, we've gone defensive right now. If if the market is taken on risk, I'll usually see like late day yesterday. I'll I'll typically find the USD or the US dollar in, in the base quote is usually telling me, and a lot of them, that uh, the market risk is on and the market's on an, on an upswing. Um, so you'll see more USD on that side. Um, so it looks like it closed out some positions. Now I just want to show you here, I'm only subscribed to four um, pairs right now. Um, and uh, uh, my other system on my Windows will do 40. I haven't tried that yet, but I'm just testing it on this Mac laptop with limited memory. Um, so those are big scenarios I want to talk about, the defensive of the market. Um, 
market on, market off writ in terms of risk. Um, so yeah, so we'll let we'll let this ride. Another thing I'm also noticing is the used margin um, because I'm not applying any stop losses on these positions. I'm only using ATR as my virtual stop loss. Uh, the question becomes on the used margin, does the used margin go up for each trade, each position I take on? Does that margin go up because it's a higher risk for the broker um, because they don't know what my stop loss will be because I'm not triggering that on the API level. So uh, that's a question I'd like to know if uh, margin does go up because the risk goes up higher for the broker. They don't know my stop loss. So that might be a negative if you're not telling your broker the stop loss that you want to use and you both take profit and your stop loss in, in, in your positions via manual trades or uh, automated trades through the API. Um, so it looks like, is it taking on more positions or is it unloading more? Um, yeah, so it's unloaded. Actually, yeah, it's just unloaded uh, quite a few. Now, the other thing I should be doing is logging these uh, positions as they take on because I can go through the logs and figure out which uh, are the profitable trades or not when they get closed out. Um, that, that's very helpful. I find that the reports from Duca's copy for this amount of trades um, can get overwhelming and it's very hard to determine what's happening on a individual level of each trade. So that is that. Obviously there are positions being put on, on and off. There's just too many of them to track. And as I said, it's better to log them to see what, what's going on. Okay, so let's get behind the scenes. All right, so here we have our um, our Redis. Now, let me show you something that's very helpful. Um, if I go into my uh, folder here, my my home directory, um, I just find it and here. Um, what I've done, and it's more reliable now, uh, is is storing all the data. Let me just see here if I have it. Um, let's see. I know it's in here. Oh, here we go. Okay, so right now, this script right here. Okay, let me just walk you through what's happening. This, uh, like I said, there's two strategies. There's this one, and then there's this one, the first one, which is exporting to multiple CSVs, CSV files, comma, subordinate values, boom, 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 boom. You can find easily examples of that online um, through the Duke's copy um, examples on the API. So we're just dumping multiple CSVs here, um, and each, each pair will get its own CSV. So what happens there is that this script, as I said, the Python is using a variety of um, indicators. I've shown this in a video with the TA lib, TA hyphen lib. And what this does, it will use EMAs. I could go into a discussion about that in a minute if you want, which I will, as well as it's calculating um, the Bollinger's uh, upper, middle, and lower, as well as the RSI. And what it's doing is it's it's watching each CSV, and it, it there's an event when that file is added or changed or modified. In this case, this one the GBP USD. When that's changed, it will trigger an event in the script, and what it will do is using TA lib. It will then go into each CSV here and calculate, let's say, the last 20, 30, 50 uh, rows in each of these CSVs. Uh, uses the uh, TA lib library to calculate each of these metrics or indicators using the EMA, uh, as I said, RSI and Bollinger. Now, as I said, I have done a lot of experimentation between, actually, this is not an EMA, it's, it's really SMA. The difference between EMA and SMA is, is, is quite interesting. Um, when I was using EMA, it's a lot more sensitive and it's really good for low level data or low level time frame, as well as um, the uh, if you're planning to scalp a lot. I, I am kind of scalping, but nowhere close 
to what I had before, okay? Um, you can see here, so it's still hung on to those trades. I have no idea um, overall what the, each individual position, but just unloaded a series of the Japanese yen ones. Actually, you know, we got some money losers, but again, I won't know until I start logging it. But going back to this, as I said, the EMA, exponential moving average, is, is very good at being overly sensitive to catch the averages. If you're using them for crosses, you will get more uh, crosses. But again, depending upon it, what you're using your time frame for, <coughs> if you're trying to be sub-second, meaning high frequency, uh, EMA can be useful. SMA is more for anything. Let's put it this way. The SMA works better where I get less false positives. Um, I, I was putting on way too many positions using the EMA, and the SMA seems to slow that down. But I was still getting quite a lot of positions that were false positives, meaning that there were too many um, positions being put on that were just money losers. An example of this is this Swiss franc business, where if there's too many positions put on for that crop, that pair, and you got nothing but losses, those losses will pile up, pile up, and your your um, your uh, P and L will, will will be very very negative, which you don't obviously want, and um, basically uh, limiting the number of positions per pair help you to minimize that. On top of if you use the ATR on your exit. As well, that will help minimize those losses. So, you know, you will have minimal losses here. These negative 28, negative 31, so on and so forth. You you will never be able to um, get around that just due to the fact of a number of things, which would include um, when you put on a position, regardless in the early milliseconds, literally, you'll 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 have a negative P and L, and that's due to the bid and ask spread from the broker versus your target level. So you'll always have negative, but you want those eventually within a little bit of time to go positive. And if they do go negative all the time, uh, that means they've basically, um, you, you're, you're just gonna be losing money consistently. And you gotta look at the probability of your winning and losing. And if you have 75% losing, you you will you will lose Market entry for but all the time which you don't want so you're trying to prevent those scenarios from happening so here we could just see that the, finally the, the franc has gone positive so because it's hanging on to those trades that's good okay so that's what we're trying to prevent is, is is having as few so we have now so the market now has gone taking on a bit of a risk because now you're starting to see the usd in the um in the uh base here and you can see voila right out of the get go it was positive and let's see if we could find so we have two positions that have gone positive right out of the get go that is very rare so if i look at that um pair let me just see what we got going on here um, market entry for so again this just the, the market changes so fast so you can see here somewhere in here here is the position. So it just took on these positions because there's an uptrend. And I bet you my system caught it. And then now it's probably thinking, oh, it's going to be a consistent uh, uptrend. The, this this Swiss franc should have been dumped by now. Um, if you ask me, let me just see how many positions we have um, for the franc. So we have two positions. Um, so... We have four positions. Uh, hang on here. Let's see here. We got four, three positions. So they've all gone. Yeah, negative. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, not too good. Anyways, that comes back to what I was saying before. On the EMAs, they're way too sensitive for this type of trading. EMA is good for um, uh, for, for really high frequency level or. Um, if you're trading on the sub second, I find SMA is good to sort of smooth that over um, and, and remove those potential bad um, bad trades. So here we go. Again, the uh, Frank, USD franc has gone sort of positive. It's bouncing around. Let's go back to what we were talking about. 
So we've got the um, Bollinger and the RSI. I found an article I posted yesterday. No, maybe I didn't post it. Anyways, what it's saying is, is that if you have your Bollingers, where there's three parts to a Bollinger, you have your upper, middle, and lower. The middle is basically the average, whereas the price, um, which will give you the upper or lower, is usually a standard deviation of two. So if you have your closing price exceed the middle, you can treat that no different than um, a, a moving average. But you have to make sure that you're coming out of a bottom, what, it, what can be called a bottoming process, and that's where the RSI comes in. So in this script for, from Python, I'm using the RSI from the TA lip, but it's just, it, it's, it's not correct. So here in my exit script on my, on my Java, you'll notice here that the RSI is correct. The RSI is correct. It's 66. Don't take on that extra position. Prevents potential bad trades. And um, if it's less than 50, uh, that means it's coming out of a bottom and uh, you have upward momentum. And that usually... Uh, is the case because if you have, as I said earlier, your middle price, or sorry, your middle of the Bollinger and the closing price crosses it, goes up, and you can confirm that with the RSI if the momentum, or sorry, the the volume is is uh, in an underbought, not un, un, not overbought, but underbought, if that's a word, um, condition. And usually that seems to be potentially correct from what I'm seeing here so that's pretty good um, okay so let's continue our conversation here. so that's what this script does okay um, and then what that will do is um, this script if it meets all the conditions as I mentioned meaning the SMAs you just have a simple fast and slow moving SMA and they cross uh, you have a buying condition. And the other buying condition I'm also testing right now, which seems to be doing okay, I will say doing okay um, for now, is when, as I said, with the Bollinger, the middle price, the closing price uh, is higher than the, um, closing price is higher than the middle part of the Bollinger on top of the RSI is less than 50 um, because it's, it's a bottoming, it's coming out of a bottom and it's not being, it's not in an overbought uh, condition. So there might be some validity, validity to that trading logic. Um, so, so far so good, but I want to test this more uh, throughout the week, next week. Okay. Um, we have an exception. Let me just see here. Uh, let me just capture where it's um, RSI. Connection, connection. This might be a threading problem. Okay, let me just see what's going on here. Um, okay, so this is where the logging in a file is helpful. Um, I can't stress the importance of that, but I've never seen these exceptions. I'll attack these later on. Already is in use. Oh, so we have, looks like potentially some form of uh, multi-threading going on with being challenged with the um, Redis. Yeah, that's probably what it is. Already in use. So we have conflicts with the Redis. Anyways, I'll address that later. Okay. Um... So let's see what's going on here. Okay, so new bugs, part of the process. So I have to improve that. Anyways, coming back to the RSI, we have uh, talked about that. So this data, those two conditions that meant, again, the uh, SMAs uh, cross the Bollinger uh, with the closing price goes, bre breaches the um, middle and the RSI is um, uh, under 50, 
On top of, I need to stress that I'm long only. Um, right now, I'm not interested in shorting. That just sort of confuses everything. On top of, there's a higher probability of not making money in shorting. From what I'm seeing, I could be wrong. Um, but for now, long only is what I'm doing. Okay, so we've got that. So when these conditions are all met, typically what will happen is um, it will then send over a signal to, to, to J4X to this, to this script right here saying, yeah, go ahead and buy. But there's one last check. And that one last check is very, very simple. The RSI needs to be less than 50. You can see here under which chart, this is USD franc. Let's see what's going on. So it's losing money. Um, Market entry you, for. I bet you right now uh, this, or let me just move five minute. Okay, so you can see an overall trend is up, but you can see here just clearly on the RSI how there's been positive, more positive momentum than negative. Um, and that's reflected here, and then it hits all this choppiness. This is what you don't want to have. And right in here, these are all false positive signals. Um, if I look at that here, this is what we're talking about here. And if I even break it down in a tick, you can see here we are hitting a positive momentum. Um, but the one minute will smooth a lot of that extra noise out. Let's just see what's going on here on the minute. Huh, that's a tough one. This is the hardest type of trading in the world. Personally, I'd rather only trade on, um, obviously on uptrends, long-term uptrends, momentum-based. As I was telling somebody in my Telegram group, I'm noticing it's tough to say because your entries are based upon momentum, but when you put on the exit, usually becomes mean reverting. So um, that's a pretty tough one to trade. Okay, so everything's all positive. Hooray, hooray, hooray. Now, if I was logging this as more positions were getting closed out, I guess the question would be, the ones that are getting closed out, are they all positive? Now, um, now let's talk about the exit. The exit that I'm using is ATR. Now, the ATR is very simple. Uh, as I said in the ATR, a uh, good example is, okay, so let's say we put on, okay, we have a position here. Um, so we did a close, it's up 4.4 pips. But let's say we had an entry here. I don't think we could find any entries along here. Here's an entry, here's a money loser. So um, I guess this, this one was, as an example, puts on a position, but because the next bar exceeded uh, the ATR on the downside, it closed out the trade to prevent any potential losses. But as you can see here, the momentum came off, did down, did dip, did dip. So it did, I think it did the right thing there by closing out that position. Now in here, there should have been a position put on, but this one got prematurely closed out. But let's say, let's say if we put on a position somewhere anywhere along here, um, so let's say we put on a position here or here, an entry, and we are using ATR. Now, typically ATR can be used no different than stop loss or take profit. On the downside, if your, your ATR uh, goes obviously goes down, it'll kick out the trade, minimize the risk. But the problem when you use stop loss, a hard stop loss that you are signaling to the broker, you're basically telling the broker, if, 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 if I predict the stop loss will go up 10%, um, in this case, maybe it did go more than 10%, you've lost potential of making profit. So you got kicked out of the, the trade too early. So the nice thing about the type of ATR I'm using, I'm using ATR, but what it will do as the price goes up, it will update the price on the ATR for both on the up and down. So if it does go up, 
the ATR will get updated. If it continues on the next bar get go up, it will update that ATR. But because now you have a new updated ATR, and this, this next bar goes on the downside, and that downside does exceed the newly updated ATR, it'll kick out it'll it'll it'll, it'll exit the trade, which means you're making money um, because it's riding that profit. And that's what we want. Here is the tough condition right here in this area. Um, as I said, I could switch the model over to start trading on the tick as I had here. And we know we have, well, let's put it this way, the RSI is an overbought. But if I was to use another indicator like, uh, I don't know, rate of change or or uh, just to see the momentum here, what's happening, I could use that on the tick level. Now, as I watch this, which I do religiously now, to try to understand what's going on, um, you may go, oh, I could apply this, 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 this uh, trade or this indicator, but you could clearly see here, it was kind of choppy and it just dropped off. Um, if that, ROC, the rate of change, caught it. It may may have exited the trade automatically. But you can see how fast your losses could be in a matter of ticks. And here we come back with a positive p and in just a matter of a few ticks, like five ticks, six ticks, we're at 80 cents. So you may need to trade on the tick level. Um, so I'm not sure what that uh, buy. So anyways. Overall, everything's positive, but uh, it's it's a difficult difficult thing to measure um, due to the fact of uh, it's just purely pure random. But I just want to show you what's been going on. This this trade here, the USD yen is doing quite well. This U, Euro USD is doing pretty good. The franc rarely to have profit, but it's doing okay. Now let's talk about the reports. Okay. So we'll do the intraday statement. You'll see lots of losses before I started this trading session, but let's just take a look anyways. Uh, so overall, as I was saying earlier, you'll see lots of blood on here on these daily moves. Since I started using this trading account, this demo account, um, you can see here the risk was on. There was more USD. Um, and... Uh, in the, in the base and uh, the, the market flip-flop between defensive and risk on uh, for that day uh, this one there's just if I was to break down the uh, levels of why there's so many losses that all came back to the SMA and was doing that um, you do have some overall overall so it's today the 14th, which was yesterday, actually two days ago. Um, but uh, overall, there's just too many losing trades, and, and that's what we obviously don't want. Um, so as of today, let's see here. So today, today's not bad. Um, actually, we're losing a lot here as well. So, um, yeah, that's from probably yes early yesterday, but this this Euro USD has been doing okay. And the market's gonna tell you what to trade as well. But uh, okay, so if I go into intraday statement, or maybe better yet, the position report. Let's see over. Hang on here. Um, these okay so we want um, as of today so these are yeah uh, two days ago which we don't want we don't care about any of this stuff there's lots of losing trades but after I applied this new trading logic using these indicators as of earlier today on the 16th um, you should so we are dealing with PL. And commission now overall let me just see if there's a summary here hmm interesting so we are seeing more winning trades commissions fairly low 
okay so you can see the losses are much more minimal which is good uh, the little PL is good some nice ones here with the yen USD and yen um, so it looks like we may have ourselves a setting winning scenario let me just uh, refresh this uh, uh, this is this is, I'll tell you something Mac the Apple software is just getting really bad lately um, so we have a, a situation the computer's freezing I'm not seeing any exceptions so it can't be memory Wow let me just uh, update this report here again um, so we want position report okay let's see if this comes up one last thing I want to mention before I forget is the RSI from TA lib you can see here this is useless uh, I, I don't rely on this RSI and I need to stress that depending upon your API or your your Python package in my case the TA lib some of them can be used some of them cannot depending upon whatever indicator you want in this case I don't rely I don't trust the RSI and TA lib it seems useless but as I've demonstrated in the um, JForex library or API it seems that the RSI is correct so be aware of that as well okay so let's see what we got here okay so this is the most up-to-date for today on the 16th okay so we've got quite a few positive again here um, so that's gross gross PL um, but overall the losses seem fairly losses seem fairly minimal you know negative five negative nine cents negative 14 cents which is pretty good the Commission stays the same unless it becomes more of an exotic pair like uh, using the ruble I can go up to four cents that's the highest I've seen but if it's a stable popular cross pair which I'm using here obviously only the popular ones the euro USD the, the, the Swiss franc the yen so on and so forth but overall I'm seeing in US dollars some good profit from this trading logic that I am showing you and some very few negative losses but when you look at it uh, this is something you also statistically should measure as I said earlier if when you use this combination of USD and the Swiss franc you need to what's the probability of actually getting a profitable trade with this pair just on its own and you can see here all the losses are with that pair with the Swiss franc so if I took out prevent the system from trading the Swiss franc USD against the Swiss franc I'd probably be able to take out these losses and have pretty damn close to a hundred percent winning uh, strategy on my hands but of course I gotta test that more often um, and, 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 and expand the number of instruments that I'm using right now as I said I'm only using four more popular ones um, but uh, I can expand it to as my one system has is 40 <clears throat> so it's quite interesting uh, let's see how our summary is doing nice these are good these are awesome and we actually got winning conditions on the Swiss franc so we're doing all right um, that is much better than what it was two days ago with all the red and now we're in green on the PL side which is great so um, I find that is good to know and I'm a happy camper as of today but this could again change um, as time passes all right so be aware of all of this stuff it's quite interesting how this all plays out but once you start to really get into the knee deep of this you will understand as I said the weird patterns of this USD CHF we've got some money losers here more all of them are CHF Frank the Swiss franc and if I took those out I'd be up virtually have no losses 
on top of uh, what else can I tell you? Um, the risk of, as I said, um, where it's a CHF for Japanese yen, that's saying the market may be going defensive. And once you start seeing the USD in the quote, base of the pair, you, 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 you start to go, huh, maybe there's more risk now in the market and people are putting on more risk. Um, and that's all dependent maybe as well as what's happening in the stock market as well. So I, I'd have to understand that better. But moving forward, um, I had this conversation with somebody last night regarding um, the, the, the Dukas copy. Moving forward, once you start to understand what I just said about the market, you have way more instruments using Dukas copy. Yes, these are CFDs, but I'm going to do an analysis to see if an actual CFD of, let's say, oil, let's say Brent, compared against the future market on that same time frame, and be able to measure uh, if the performance is the same. If it is, you don't have to go out and buy future contracts. You can just use a CFD within Duca's copy and maybe get the same performance with less risk because you don't have to uh, pay up front for the full contract prices. And same with the um, ETFs as well. And with the ETFs and the indexes, you can base on the um, on the sectors as well. And there is definitely com major commodities here. So there's a variety of strategies I can use within a Dukas copy account for other types of strategies depending upon the asset class that I want to use. Obviously, I'm using the uh, Forex. On top of, rumor has it, I don't know when it'll happen, is that the Dukas copy will be adding on cryptocurrency. I mean, yes, it's only going to add uh, Bitcoin and um, uh, Ethereum, which are the two most popular. So there'll be some money to be made in that asset class as well with crypto. And maybe I don't need to kill myself writing a separate um, cryptocurrency script with all the different exchanges when I could just use the simple one between um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And again, if I'm going to get the same behavior as if I'm on a major cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrency exchange as well. So that's pretty well it. But you can see here we've definitely got a hot trade situation of 897. Um, some losing trades, once again, usually it's, it's, it includes the, that Swiss franc. Again, this is real time. You can see, um, actually, no, that's not true. But that CHF, the Swiss franc, I got to really watch that because um, you have a higher probability to lose money using that pair. Um, so there's all different types of analysis you got to look at. Anyways, over and out. Hopefully this will help you out, and we shall talk to you soon. Later. Hey, everybody. Brian here from quantlabs.net. Okay, uh, very important addendum. I forgot. I, I just discovered in this position report from Duca's copy. Um, I got thrown off by a number of open positions, and they seem to be profitable, which is not bad, I guess. But then when you look at the closed positions, I should be looking at this. So again, it's the same columns, gross P&L and commission. Um, and then of course the time and date. So let's check out um, here at the bottom. And uh, it's not as pretty as I would have liked. So if we go to the bottom, you'll see here there's a lot more losing positions. There's quite a few winning. And again, they are the, the Japanese yen. But it's clearly not what I would want. So overall, we are losing more than winning. Um, so when you look at the individual uh, profit level of each position, they're nothing to brag about but um, overall it's what's needs that tells me is that um, you know let me just go through it but you can see there's just as probably starting from about this point let's say it's about even of winners versus losers again I'm not gonna get into the math of it and totaling it all I mean I could but um, overall, when you look at the, let me just reset, re refresh this. So the current open positions that we have on is 
we have winners. Okay, these are the open positions, which they're all majority of them look like they're winning. So that says the entries look okay, but it's the ETR is just and the exit's not working as it should. So that's what I got to work on. Okay, um, so don't ever look at the um, the overall a statement here because um, that's the overall of what's doing it, which looks good. But when you look at all these situations, um, they get closed out, they, they, they're losers. So do understand that. Okay, so I just wanted to put that out there as well. Okay, later.